Thank you, ladies. Beautiful song. By grace alone, through faith alone, in... Very good, very good, very good. That is the foundation of the book of Galatians, and we have been journeying through that book uh, for the last couple of months, and Lord willing, next week we're going to pick right back up where we left off last week. But this morning I want to give a little bit of a different message, I guess a special message since we're stepping out of our series a message that was laid on my heart. It's one of those messages that I heard a long time ago, took good notes, tucked it away, and said, you know what, there's a point in time where the flock that the Lord has put under me is going to need to hear this, and I believe that today is the day. So I want to begin this morning with a quote. <clears throat> Christmas is an amazing time of year. But as amazing as it is, when it comes to Christmas, over the years, the line between sacred and secular has become really blurred. Tradition and sentimentality have turned Christmas into a holiday instead of a holy day. And in between the parties, the gifts, and the Hallmark Channel, our knowledge of Christmas has become more cultural and less biblical. Now, before I go any further, I want you to know that I'm not getting ready to say bah humbug. I'm not Ebenezer Scrooge. I have to admit this, I have, not this season, but I have in the past watched Christmas movies on the Hallmark Channel, right? I, I don't believe in taking the fun out of Christmas. I, I love Christmas traditions. Uh, in fact, I bet if I were to let you, uh, each one of your families could tell of some unique Christmas traditions that you have. And they're unique because they're your, your, your families. We have several, but I'll tell you one that we've developed since we've uh, come here to Lighthouse uh, after the New Year, or New Year's Eve, after the Christmas Eve <clears throat> service, which I hope you're planning to come to. That's Monday night at six o'clock. We have a wonderful time, an hour or less, and you'll be on your way. Once that service is over, my family and I, and sometimes some other families from the church, we go out to eat uh, on Christmas Eve. And you might be thinking, well, that's not that very unique. A lot of people go out to eat, yes, but do a lot of people go across the Memorial Bridge and go to the McDonald's in Parkersburg, right? <laughs> How many of you do that? We've done it for so long now that if we weren't to show up this coming Monday night, the manager there would probably call and probably ask where we were. It is our tradition. And there's nothing wrong with those. I read of a family who goes out and has Chinese every Christmas evening. Why? Because one Christmas evening, their kids wanted Chinese. They started doing it, and that's what they do. Another family I've heard of goes to Waffle House on Christmas morning. Yes, there are Waffle Houses that are open on Christmas morning. And yes, it's a very greasy Christmas when you go to Waffle House on Christmas morning. But there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the traditions of Christmas as long as we don't get focused on them. As long as we stay focused on the miracle of Christmas. Christmas can't just be fun. Oh, it's a lot of fun, but it can't just be fun. We have to remember the miracle. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning, the miracle of Christmas. I want to talk about the miracle of God setting the stage. I want to talk about the miracle of the virgin birth. And I want to talk about the miracle of the absolute God-ordained miracle of the power of prophecy. Those are the things we're going to look at this morning in a message that I've entitled, The Miracle of Christmas. Number one, the miracle of how God set the stage. Now let me begin this by giving you a statistic. Did you know that over the course of your life, on average, over the course of your life, you're going to spend six months waiting on stuff six months waiting to be seated at the restaurant six months waiting in the line at the BMV to get your license six months waiting in line at the amusement park to ride your favorite coaster six months waiting at the doctor's office uh, you're gonna spend time waiting for customer service agents to come back on the line and give you some customer service you're gonna spend time waiting on your pastor to finish his message I knew it was coming. You're going to be waiting, 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 waiting. And most of the time, if we were honest, waiting is not fun. Well, when we look at the first Christmas story and the time preparing for that, 
we're going to see that the nation of Israel had been waiting for a really, really, really long time. Waiting for their Messiah. Desperately waiting for Jesus to be born. Galatians, turn there with me. You said, wait a second, Pastor Rob, you just said we weren't going to Galatians. No, I said we weren't going to have the series in Galatians. We got to turn there because there's a very important verse. Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5, very important uh, phrase begins the verse. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now last week we talked about the beauty of this. God adopting us and in this adoption bringing reconciliation to a relationship, bringing justification by faith. And you're like, what does that have to do with Christmas? Or what does this verse, how does it tie in with the first Christmas? Well, look again at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, but when the fullness of time had come, and who was the, the judge of when the fullness of time had come? God. God was setting the stage. And when it was ready, when the time had come, what is the next line? God sent forth His Son. Amen? God sent Jesus. Let me tie it in with our series. God sent grace. Grace came when God was ready for it to come. Now let's look at that phrase, the fullness of time. I've told you how important it is to at times examine the original language. And with the technology we have out there, anybody can do that. Looking at the word picture, the fullness of time, it's a very picturesque Greek phrase. It expresses something that is just the ultimate of readiness. The pictures, two pictures that it gives, is a, a big, red, juicy, ripe apple just ready to fall off of the tree. It cannot get any more ripe. It also is a word picture uh, of a woman who is pregnant, and she is in the last stages of pregnancy. She is ready. Uh, the contractions have started. That baby is coming. This is what the fullness of time meant here. It, it describes the moment in history when, according to God's sovereign plan, all of the pieces were on the board. All of the things were in place. The time was right. God was ready. And at that moment, at that moment, no earlier, no later, God looked at his son and said, It is time. I want to send you to them. I want to send grace to them. And oh, how the children of Israel had been waiting. In fact, if you look through the Old Testament, you're going to see that the, the story, the history behind the nation of Israel is filled with waiting. Abraham waited for that promise when God said, I'm going to make a nation come from you that's immeasurable. Uh, the, the children of Israel enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. They were waiting on the promise of God which said, I will deliver you. The, 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 the captives in Babylon were waiting from the promise of God who had said, this will only last 70 years. I will deliver you. And on and on and on in the story of the, of the Old Testament, you can see time and time again when the Israelites were waiting. They had to wait on God so much that no doubt because they were human just like us, there were probably times when they were wondering, okay, God gave a promise, but will He keep it? Will God keep His promise? They were really, really wondering that when it came to the ultimate promise, the promise of the Savior. Now, I want to show you something in my Bible. And you probably have one, I don't want to say just like it, it may be a little different, but it's this page right here. On mine, uh, it's, got a, it's all white and it says something about the New Testament, but this is the page in the Bible that divides, it separates. The last chapter in the last book of the Old Testament with the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament. Malachi to Matthew. One white page that literally I can flip in milliseconds. But can I tell you what that white page represents? When it comes to the children of Israel waiting on the ultimate promise of God to send the Messiah, you want to know what it represents? That single white page represents over 400 years of history. Over 400 years of stuff going on with the nation of Israel. Over 400 years years. Now, they had waited thousands of years 
I mean, think about all the way back to the promise that Abraham was given, that Josh talked about, through from him, from his family. All the nations were going to be blessed. That was in Genesis thousands of years ago. You say, so what's, what's so special about that white page? What's so special about that last 400 years? It probably was the hardest and toughest part of the wait. Why? Because that white page represents 400 years of God being totally silent. Silent. There was no miracles. There was no prophetic word. There were no prophets that were speaking. God was silent. I really believe that some of you here this morning, this is your testimony. God has been silent for a while. You feel like you're living on that white page. The children of Israel were waiting for the miracle of a Savior. You're waiting for a miracle from God. You need this to be a miraculous Christmas, and yet you wonder why the heavens are silent. You've prayed to the point where you are wondering, like the children of Israel no doubt did, you're wondering if God is listening. You're wondering if God hears you. Maybe you've gotten to the point where Satan has now begun to come in and cause you to doubt God's word. You're wondering possibly even if there really is a God at all. Well, this morning, I want to share some very good news with you. Just because God is silent, does not mean he's not working. Just because God is silent, it doesn't mean he's not answering your prayers. Just because God is silent, it does not mean he is not setting the stage for a miracle. The next couple of minutes, you're going to see a video. It's going to kind of open your eyes, if you've not seen this before, going to open your eyes to what God was doing as he was preparing to send the miracle of Jesus. How he was miraculously setting the stage, though he was absolutely quiet. Brother Nathan? Here's some of what happened during those 400 years of silence. The Persian Empire was expanding its territory, and they started getting a little too close to the Greeks. So Philip of Macedon united the Greeks and led them in battle against the Persians. After Philip's death, his son Alexander took over. This was probably around 350 years before Jesus was born. We know him as Alexander the Great because he conquered the entire known world in about 12 years. As a result of Alexander's influence, the world became Greek in both thought and language, and for the first time since the Tower of Babel, the world was united by a single language. Everyone spoke a little Greek. And so God was making a way for Jesus to be born into a world where everyone spoke the same language. Another reason this was so important was because the Greeks had the Old Testament scriptures, which were written in Hebrew, translated into Greek in 280 BC. So the whole world could now learn for themselves about the promises of a Messiah coming. It was also the right time philosophically. Because of the Greeks' influence, most people were accustomed to the Socratic method of learning. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, they taught people to learn by questioning and so there were a lot of questions being asked without many answers. Then, in 63 BC, the Romans conquered the Greeks and they took over the duties of ruling the world. And they ruled over Israel with an iron fist. They oppressed and exploited the Jewish people. They violently put down all opposition. And because of this abuse, the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. If this would not have happened, Christianity, would have had a hard time getting out of Israel. But the Romans' power also had another effect. Caesar Augustus was on the throne, and during the lifetime of Jesus, and under his rule, peace came to the Roman Empire. In fact, for the next two centuries, there was peace. This unique time in history is known as the Pax Romana. It's really the only window, significant window, in human history where there was world peace. Because of this peace, travel was completely changed. Roads were built, travel became common. In fact, a type of highway patrol was even established. And all of this made it just the right time for Jesus to be born and for the gospel message to spread. Do you see what God was doing? He was orchestrating all the pieces in just the right way 
so that Jesus would come at just the right time. Folks, God didn't go on an extended vacation for 400 years and then all of a sudden remember, oh yeah, I need to do something for the nation of Israel. I need to send a Savior. Though God was quiet, He was at work. He was miraculously setting the stage for the greatest miracle to ever happen and that was for grace to come. That was for Jesus to come. And can I tell you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? That though in your life it may seem as if God is silent and He may be, Please know that he hasn't forgotten about you. Please know that right now he's working, setting the stage for what he wants to do with you, in you, through you. God can be trusted. You can trust God's timing, whether you understand it or not. You can trust God's timing, whether it makes sense or not. You can trust him. And I know this morning, even in just this first point of this message, the miracle of Christmas, I know that God is speaking. I know that there are people waiting. I know that there are people struggling. I know that there are people praying. And I know at times it seems like God is silent. But please remember, no matter how long He asks you to wait, no matter how long He asks you to trust, you can trust Him with His timing. Let Him continue miraculously setting the stage like He did then in your life. Well, the next part of the miracle of Christmas that I want to talk about is the miracle of the virgin birth. Do you know that the virgin birth is one of the primary things that the world attacks, one of the primary things that even some very liberal theologians attack? In fact, uh, they call Christians, they, 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 they call it, we're, we're a little dim, they say, because of what we believe. Listen to how this one uh, New York Times reporter put it. It was very plain. He said, the faith in the virgin birth reflects the way American Christianity is becoming less intellectual and more mystical over time. One of the primary attacks on Orthodox Christianity was about the validity, the accuracy of the literal, actual, physical birth of Jesus Christ from a virgin. And they attack this because they're trying to uh, degrade and attack Jesus himself, the Son. Because if they can attack and, and kind of... Uh, discredit the virgin birth and they can discredit Jesus as the son of God and if they can discredit that they can discredit his word they can discredit his teaching and so therefore then they can pick and choose what they want to have a part of their life and what they want to disregard and so for this a few moments I want to talk to you about the validity I want to talk to you about the miraculousness of the virgin birth and why it is so important why it's not just a trivial fact, why it is part of the foundation of Jesus being who he was and doing what he said he would do. Now, one of the first things I want to talk about when it comes to the virgin birth is the whole issue of biblical authority. One of the attacks that the, vir the miracle of the virgin birth has is, well, it's not mentioned that much in Scripture. In fact, a lot of liberal theologians say it's only mentioned in two of the four Gospels. Can I tell you something about the authority of God's Word? It doesn't matter if something is only taught once. The Bible is the inerrant Word of God. All of it. God doesn't need to say something 15 times for us to understand that it is truly something that happened or it's truly something that He wants us to do. Why is it that we think that? We have no right to weigh the truthfulness of biblical teachings by the repetition of scripture. God only has to say something once. It is his word. It is his authority. I love how one scholar stated it when he said this. If we do not hold to the word of God. If we do not hold to the virgin birth. Despite the fact that the Bible asserts it. When we have compromised the authority of the Bible. And there is no principal reason why we should hold to its other teachings. Thus rejecting the virgin birth has implications reaching far beyond the doctrine itself, right? If there's one part of Scripture that's not true, how can we trust that any of it is? The virgin birth happened. Why? Because God made it happen, and it was a miracle. But the authority of the Bible is not the only thing that is in danger if the virgin birth didn't happen. Let me talk to you about the second part, and that is this. We've got to believe in, have faith in, and even defend the virgin birth because if Jesus was born of human parents, 
If Jesus had a biological father here on this earth, if Jesus had a biological mother, and that is how he's conceived, and that's how he was born, what was Jesus? A fallen man, a sinner. He was just like us. And so therefore, if Jesus was conceived by humans and born into this world, a man, then he's a sinner just like me. And you want to know why, even if I was willing to, I can't climb up on a cross and die? Well, I guess I could do that. And I could say that I'm doing this to save you from your sins. But you want to know why that doesn't work? Why it wouldn't count? Why? I am a... I know it's hard for you to believe. But I am. And because I am a sinner, I have no right. I do not qualify. We needed someone who could do what Adam didn't do. And that's what Jesus did when grace came. He couldn't just come and die. Grace had to come. Jesus had to come. Jesus had to live a life being tempted in all areas as we were and are, the Bible says. And yet the difference is, Jesus didn't sin. And so because he didn't sin, he was perfect, like Adam was when Adam was created. And so Jesus is called the second Adam. And so because he did live a life, tempted yet never sinning, that qualified him to get up on that cross of Calvary and shed his perfect sinless blood to cover our sins. But let me tell you why that's important, obviously, because without redemption, you and I deserve hell. But if there was no miracle in the manger, miracle of the virgin birth, there could be no miracle in Calvary. Because if Jesus came by human parents, then him dying on the cross was no different than me dying on the cross. But because of the miracle in the manger that came from the miracle of the virgin birth, we have the miracle of Calvary. And Jesus was qualified as the perfect and holy Son of God. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Here's another problem with doubting the virgin birth. You look back over history, you will see that when men begin to doubt the virgin birth, they don't stop there. They don't believe the virgin birth, and one doubt leads to another until the Jesus they believe in is a Jesus, is a Savior that they have created, not the one in the Bible. We have to know that this was the miracle of Christmas because of the miracle of God setting the stage, the miracle of the virgin birth. But can I tell you something about miracles? You don't have to believe them. Oh, a miracle invites you to make a decision, but you don't have to make that decision. I love how Martin Luther uh, said it when he was making remarks about the incarnation. He said it consisted of three miracles. The first, that God became a man. The second, that a virgin was a mother. And then the third, that the heart of man should believe it. But can I tell you something? just like I've talked to you about when it comes to the evidence of evolution versus the evidence of creation and where I believe there is far more of, it's the same thing with the story of Jesus. When you begin looking at the odds, the odds are in your favor when you side with Jesus. With that, we shift to the third part of the miracle of Christmas, and that is the miracle of prophecy. I'm going to start this off by telling you a story that I had never heard of until I began preparing for this message. It involves a man by the name of Michael Lee. Anybody in here graduate high school in the year 1993? Any 1993 graduates? Man, I was hoping we'd have at least one. If my wife was in here, she would raise her hand. No 1993 graduates? Well, I was 1991, so I was a couple of years before. But in 1993, a guy by the name of Michael Lee graduated high school in California. Now, you may say, why is that significant? It's not. But when he graduated, the year he graduated, he had his yearbook. And in his yearbook, 1993, here is what Michael Lee wrote. And I quote, 1993, mind you, here's what he wrote. I quote, Chicago Cubs, 2016 world champions, comma, you heard it here first, period, end quote, 1993. Now, for those of you that could care less about baseball, you might be sitting there going, whoop. De-doo. Well, let me tell you what happened. The Chicago Cubs beat the Cleveland Indians 8-7 to in Game 7, 4-3, to to win the World Series in, Stephen, 2016. Now, you might be sitting back there going, wow, how did he do that? What well, can I tell you? L-U-C-K. Luck. Blind luck. 
Now, it's astounding, yes. But man, if you're astounded by that, then let me tell you something else you're going to be absolutely astounded by. Can I tell you, there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Bible. Hundreds and thousands of years before the events occurred that were prophesied. And these prophecies came to be to the T. To the T. And they were about one man, and that man was Jesus. And we're going to look over just a couple today because I want you to, to see and to sense the miracle of Christmas as it is anchored down by the miracle of prophecy. The first, first, and it was really cool because Kevin uh, Hassel was in the first service and Kevin comes uh, with his family and uh, they were in here today and it was, it was awesome that he was in here because I got to ask him the question. He's, a, he's just, a, just a beyond intelligent young man who not only works a full-time job but also works through uh, the Creation Museum and going around and giving lectures about creation versus evolution and the age of the earth. And I asked him how old the earth was, at least the, uh, the conservative viewpoint. About 6,000 years is what they said. So when we get to Genesis 3.15, we're talking back at the very beginning of the world, right? It was in the Garden of Eden. It was right after Adam and Eve had sinned. And Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is also one of the first prophecies about Jesus in the Bible. Okay, God comes to the snake, God comes to Satan, and here's what he says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, who do you think they're talking about? Jesus. Jesus. There's a capital S in most translations on the one seed because it is speaking of Jesus. But the question then is why? Why can't this statement point to anyone else? You want to know why? First, I'll tell you biologically. A woman produces no seed. Okay? A woman doesn't do that. Then in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the Bible always speaks, other than in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the Bible always speaks of the seed of man. And so therefore, the seed that God is talking about here with a capital S has to be the seed of Jesus miraculously placed into the virgin womb of Mary by God, the Holy Spirit. Because if it was anything else, as we have talked about, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Because all of us, since Adam fell, are fallen individuals. We are sinners. God made that prophecy, and it came true. But let's fast forward to about 700 years before Jesus was born. The prophet Isaiah is speaking, talking to King Ahaz. And if you look at Isaiah 7, 14, here is what he says. 700 years prior. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then you get into Matthew chapter 1, verses 20, 21, and 22. You see that the angel is speaking to Joseph. He's telling him that it's okay to go and marry Mary because Mary is pregnant, but is it a miraculous thing that has come from God? And he references what happened 700 years ago, letting Joseph know that the prophet Isaiah had spoken of this, and now this has happened. So what Isaiah predicted 700 years earlier... The angel of God is looking at Joseph and he's saying, this has happened. And that prophecy then goes on all the way back to the prophecy of God in the garden. Now, the next one I want to talk about is really cool because it's almost as if God was trying to set himself up for failure. And what I mean by that is God was trying to make it so most, almost so impossible that we wouldn't do anything but go, wow, that was God, Right? And that's what we should do when it comes to the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of God setting the stage, the miracle of the virgin birth, the miracle of prophecy is be able to sit back and go, man, I can't possibly grab all that, but it is God. Because the miraculousness of Christmas comes from Him. So here's what I'm talking about. Here's how God kind of narrows it down and shows that this is totally of Him. How many sons did Noah have? Three would be the answer. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All of a sudden, the flood has happened. The rest of the world's population is going to come from these three young men and their wives. All of a sudden, or just almost immediately, God 
narrows it down, cuts two-thirds of the human population out when he says that Jesus, grace, is going to come through the lineage of Shem. From there, God calls Abraham. He states the Messiah is going to come as a descendant of Abraham. But if you remember, Abraham tried to help God. Right? He was waiting and waiting and waiting, but he didn't do a good job waiting. And what happened because of that? What was the son's name that came? Ishmael. And God says, no, no. Though a whole race of people, a whole lot of people are going to come through Ishmael, Jesus The king is coming through Isaac. The Messiah will come through him. God continues to narrow down the lineage of the coming Messiah until he does something super drastic. He says it's going to come from the house of David. He adds then what I call some actual, like, extra miraculousness. This is where we go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. God narrows this way down to the point where he says, You know what? The Messiah is coming. And he's going to be born of a virgin in a town with a population of less than a thousand and what was the name of that town Bethlehem and you want to know where Jesus was born Micah chapter 5 verse 2 but you Bethlehem though you are little among the thousands of Judah yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel now this is not a prophecy conference. This is not, I mean, we could sit up here and talk about... I mean, there are, there are prophecies in Malachi 3, prophecies in Psalms 118, Daniel 9, Zechariah 11, Haggai chapter 2, Psalm 22, Psalm 41. I mean, we could name these and we could go back and talk about them, but that's not the point today. You can see the miraculousness of God, the miraculousness of prophecy and how that played into Christmas. But I do want to share something with you. Something I found that was just absolutely amazing this week. And I actually want to use science. I want to use the science of probability. And we're going to narrow this down twice. First, we're going to take it from hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. We're going to bring it down to 48. Do you want to know, using the science of probability, the likelihood that just 48 of these biblical prophecies could be fulfilled to the letter through one single man and those all be the same man. You want to know the likelihood? I'm not very good at math, so I'm going to try to say this right. It's 1 in 10 to the power of 157. Now, that's 1 to 1, and that second one has 157 zeros in it. Do you know how long it takes, even if you go 1s, 10s, 100s, 1000s, 10,000s, 100,000s, millions? It it takes a while. I even got on Google trying to look up a name for that number. And and they have them. I just can't remember it. It was so long. I really struggled trying to grasp what that meant. So then I narrowed it down a little more. Do you want to know what the probability is of one man? Of eight, not 48, just eight of these prophecies coming true in one man, by one man, to the letter. You want to know what it is? It's one in one with 17 zeros after it. 17 zeros. You say, Rob, what are you getting at? That these things are impossible to happen without a miracle from God. Christmas is a miracle. Jesus is a miracle. Grace is a miracle. The virgin birth is a miracle. We serve a God of miracles. I'm going to blow your mind one last time. You want to know the probability of these prophecies happening? I've used this illustration before, but it's so powerful, I'm going to use it again. Picture with me the state of Texas. It is a very big state. And picture, if you will, us having the ability to fill every square inch of the state of Texas, every square inch with two feet of ping pong balls. Two feet, entire length and breadth of Texas. And then let's take one of those ping pong balls and let's paint it red and let's throw it in with the rest of the ping pong balls and randomly let it get dispersed. And then let's take one person and blindfold them And let's pick a random spot in the state of Texas with two feet of ping pong balls all over the place with one red ping pong ball. Let's put that person in a random location and here's the instructions. Sir or ma'am, we're not taking the blindfold off. Reach down and pick up one ping pong ball. 
You want to know that there's more chance of him picking up one ping pong ball and it being the red ping pong ball than there is of all of the prophecies that were prophesied being fulfilled to the letter in one man, Jesus? Here's the good news I've got for you today. I serve a God of the impossible. I serve a miraculous God. And Jesus Christ, he's standing up here today and he's got that red ping pong ball. Jesus is a miracle. Grace is a miracle. Christmas is a miracle. My question to you this morning is this. Do you believe in the miracle of the manger or not? If you don't, I pray that the Holy Spirit is working on you right now, letting you know why you should. Because without the miracle of the manger, putting your faith and trust in that Jesus, in that grace, in what he did in the manger, in his life, in his death, there is no miracle of redemption for you. All that's left for you is judgment. And I have told you about the greatest Christmas present ever given, the gift of grace. Will you accept it today?